film as well. Yeah. Uh, um, what what strikes me around Chad is a lot of the really good media that came out at the time of um, the financial crisis, when it became clear that the austerity was basically for everybody else, not for the likes of Shagger Hancock, um, that the, the uh, uh, documentary started to appear then, and there was there, there, there was a there was a huge increase in people's awareness. The Occupy movement, and I know you 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 you, you spent a lot of time down at the Bank of Ideas. Now that movement was infiltrated and sidelined. And a similar movement doesn't seem to have coalesced around COVID-19. But what John's blog today is really saying is, look, we've got to widen out this discussion. Um, the emergency powers are in danger of becoming permanent. Um, th there's no reason why they should have been extended the way they have. I mean, it's amazing, I, isn't it? Because I think originally they said it was sort of six months or three months and and they said it would be rolling. Well, a, exactly. They'd have to ask for permission to get it renewed. Now we never hear about them asking for permission anymore. Exactly. So effectively, um, this demo today, if it's as big as the last one, which which I've no reason to doubt it won't that, that it won't be bigger than that. I suspect it will. But what John I says do. is there's a TQC rally as well. I, I think I think it's going to be much smaller. But really. Yeah, because the last one was fucking huge, and the one yeah, before but was... no, no one know about knew about that one either, Ranjan. No, no one knew about that one either, uh, and it wasn't reported. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, because the whole point is, and this is in line with what you're saying. I think the whole of the last one and the one before, I think, was organised on Telegram. Uh, so completely well, yes, and, and so it's, it's untrackable. Word of mouth, yeah, word of mouth. Um, the pubs have opened and so people, you know, I've had conversations with, with, with people who have come into contact with people they haven't seen for a long time. And, and, and the naturally, people sort of say, well, what do you make of this then? Because I've, I've had the conversation with quite a lot of people um, when, I've been o when I was over last time. I've, I've spent half of the whole period in Sweden and, and, and I've, I've travelled to the UK a lot since the first lockdown opened up so i was over in the january yeah. yeah yeah then i was over in the june and then i was over several times and then i came back last october when the second lockdown started because the atmosphere ahead of that second lockdown was just plain weird um i and 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 in sweden it's got a bit weird here the government collapsed last week there was a vote of no no, no confidence and I was amazed to look at the Swedish parliament and see them all wearing masks. They were all wearing masks. And, and that must have been for the benefit of politicians elsewhere. Basically, like, we, we, we really wish we could wield the, 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 uh, the naughty stick um, a, a, as much as you have, but we haven't been able to. But we can show our solidarity by all wearing these silly masks. You do about the Swedish in, ones, right? Yeah, yeah. OK. Because I remember you well, mentioned they were working there. They're yeah. not mandated in Sweden. The, 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 the advice is not to wear one if you haven't had professional training in wearing one and preferably a professionally fitted proper one. That, that, really? That's the advice. And if you go into a hospital, you have to wear one or if you go to see a doctor. Can, um, I, can, I, can, well, I, can, I, um, can I invoke emergency interruption, please? Mm hmm. I was in Leicester Square on Thursday evening and um, it was an emergency book purchase. And um, have you ever heard of the Love Police? Yes, yeah, I have. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so Shine. Yeah, one um, of them. And Charles Beach. Yeah, I don't know which one it was, but one of them was there with his megaphone. Uh, and it was quite funny. Well, it was. Charlie, bro I mean, it's it, it's all Danny Shine now. I used to watch his stuff a lot when I first came to Sweden. I really, he's a really entertaining guy. Yeah, so he so he cracks open the megaphone, uh, and he's reverse serenading somebody on a luxury balcony at um, Leicester Square. He's basically mm -hmm. she's sticking a finger up at him, and he's basically going, 
I don't know. I mean, he's not ridiculing her for being a top. I wasn't sure if I recognised her. But she said something like, I've had the vaccine. Everything's brilliant. And so he said, um, would you take drugs from any drug dealer if they said it was free? Um, and he went down that line of argument. Uh, uh, and so some people were ridiculing him. Obviously, he can stand up for himself. He's doing his thing. Next to me were Italian and Pole. Uh, cabin crew living in Edinburgh for some airline. Uh -huh. I mentioned to them that the day before I'd been watching the Germany, or I'd been watching the England game on German television, and in the break, there were a couple of stories. I mentioned there was the one story about the UEFA and the rainbow and Munich, Airport, uh, Munich Stadium to do with gay rights. And then the other right. one, there was some green meeting in Germany, and they had my favourite person. I mean, me and my friend Richard, we just look up German female politicians for a laugh just to see what they're all about. And so my favourite was there, Annalena Baerbach, uh, head of the Greens, just going, oh, like this. But they were all there. All of the, all of the top guys, they're going, oh. So I was just saying to this poll lady, um, they're all Nazis, especially the Greens. I mean, you know, this is my yeah. view. And she said to me, oh, absolutely. Young woman. She said, absolutely. I mean, you know, what's the story? It's not like she was loyal to her industry of flying, but she was just basically said, yeah. you know, what the fuck's going on? So um, yeah. for some reason, what, what you were saying just now about awareness of ideas about things and people talking to each other, that's it. Yeah, so we were talking about lockdowns and stuff like that. And, you know, they were basically saying, as soon as we get into the back room, we take our masks off and we just relax. You know, what, you know, what is yeah. the story? Why are we being made to do this? Um, that's it. No, no, no. So, so she told me that the Polish government is anti-EU at the moment, anti-gay rights, but they're totally communist when it comes to masks. Totally communist. Or, they're authoritarian when it comes to masks. So right. that was so, that, so that's like your Swedish story, which is like, you know, these people who, you know, whatever it is, you know, when it comes down to it for a certain reason, the mask thing is they love that. They love that mask thing. Even the ones who, who well, would in, be anti-mask. In the shock doctrine, there's a whole thing about sensory, uh, sens sensory deprivation okay. and the torture techniques um, that right. were developed in the 50s by the CIA and what uh, have you. Literal, literal and one shock. Of the okay. is, shock, shock, shock. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but part of the dehumanization and discombobulation process is to make people wear face coverings and masks or hoods or whatever. Um, I, and, and it is to uh, it's to dehumanize people. It, it's she so says, that when people it's it, what it is, Ranjan, is that they want people to fear seeing other people. And so they want to see the shape as a human being, as a profession, a, 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 a potential threat or a potential carrier of some disease. Can I just and say where she made this point before? Yeah, yeah. In, um, in, in No Logo, there's a bit where she talks about the uniform that you wear when you work at McDonald's. And she says that, you know, basically, if you're a beautiful woman and you are the shape of a beautiful woman, when you put that McDonald's uniform on, you are no longer that. You have become dehumanized. They turn everyone into a blob. Um, mm. It's quite, quite similar to what you just said. You know, on the one hand, it's I'm here to help you. On the other hand, it's I'm potentially a carrier. That, that, well, that, that, that's the mask thing. It, it's a psychological thing. There's one, there's one justification for it psychologically, which isn't sinister. It, it, the only argument that stands up in their favour, and that is that it will, it reminds people to do other things that do work. If you're wearing a mask, you're more likely to remember to wash your hands or to social distance or, or whatever. Now, I think that is, is the reason. True. That is the reason they do it. The World Health Organization. That's has... the reason they say they do it, and that's the reason that stands up. But yeah. I don't think that's the reason they do do it. Yeah, sure, sure. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, it's not nice, is it? Yeah, it it, it, it is. Yeah, but but it, it's a beard in a way to purpose or effect where uh, I think is to enhance the fear level and to dehumanize 
uh, other people. I, you know, I, and whether that, I, I think that's intentional, but it is an unintentional consequence anyway. It, it is a con one of the one of the consequences is, as you say, like the McDonald's uniforms, it does have the other effect as well. Um, and if you were a caring government, you would weigh up that collateral harm yeah. because it, it harms human relations. You know, it, it it harms the smooth and what would be the word the the functioning of of, of interpersonal relationships in society uh, Roger, between strangers Roger, when and I, what happens. Yeah, Roger. When I when I interviewed David Graeber properly for the last time, so that was two and a half years ago. Uh, one of the things that we talked about was to do with the what is it the regulation of regulation you know what i'm talking about you know when yeah. you know when the regulators don't do it right and you say who's overseeing them blah 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 and so then it goes into you know and so he made the thing he said infinite regression turtles all the way down you know i, I know you're familiar yeah. with all of this stuff so um the but one of the things that i said to him so what do you think you know what are the solutions to this level of abstraction that's going on in the modern world. And he, he basically said something along the lines of, well, a little bit more eye contact might help. You know, being in mm. the room uh, with the people that you trust so that they don't just fuck you over and walk away, you know, that type of thing. Mm. And so the mask appears to be also part of that, you know, part of, yeah. um, you know, part, part of preventing, you know, so, you know, eye contact at most, you know, uh, but yeah. even that will be eyes full of fear. Um, when when you smile at someone and, and you're really smiling and your eye, you know, when you because people smile with their eyes, a false yeah. smile, the eyes don't smile, um, and a smile can just cheer up, well, it can cheer up my day, you know, if if, if someone smiles at you, say so, say for instance, um, you're gonna bump into someone or something, and and, and you've been a bit clumsy. And you look up and you say, oh, I'm really sorry. And someone actually just smiles at you and say, oh, not to worry, you know, no harm done. Mm. You know, a, a smile that goes with that just, you know, it, it can set your mind at rest. Whereas if the same thing happened and someone was wearing a mask and, you know, you wouldn't, you don't know what's the reaction. What, you know, because, well, you know, you know, yeah, you know, you know, body language of reading someone's face. Exactly. Well, somebody told me 15 years ago that because it's so easy to misinterpret people on email, occasionally sticking an emoticon that has a smile on it can actually help in case somebody mis is about to misinterpret what you're saying. You know, sticking the mood yeah. on as being up is just part of the process of saying, listen, I'm not being sarcastic. Um, yeah. Yeah, we've covered a lot of ground already in this conversation. Say again? We've covered a lot of ground in this conversation. I mean, my mind is actually, I mean, I've had a good day already, but my mind is really racing at um, some of the different ideas. Because in Greek theatre, you've got the concept of the mask um, and, and and that type of thing. So, you know, just, just thinking about some of those things, about the role it plays and, you know, you know, the metaphorical mask, the real mask, and of course, everything that, you know, that is lobbying and politics. And then trying to make it, drop that down to the lowest level so that we're all opposing each other. So in the same way that you have the decentralization, you know, that you, you've got the type of decentralization that's being idealized in worlds of crypto and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, from a theater of the oppressed perspective, I do think they want everyone to look at everyone else as a potential carrier, as a potential oppressor, uh, and all of this kind of stuff. So nobody trusts anyone and everything is, um, no. To divide and rule, and and, yeah. and the the state might be a tyrant, but it's the only thing that can look after you. Yeah, I, I had fast. a long chat at that party I went to last night. I was talking to a, an Italian guy from Sicily uh -huh. who lives in Sweden. I, I I was actually had a chat to him. He's the first person I sort of met really that that's admitted to watching the Swedish Theory of Love, the Gandini uh, film, which is a brilliant film. It's on my BitChute channel. It is worth watching. 
Um, and we had a long chat about that because, you know, I've got various linguistic theories about why the the way they do things in Sweden works here is related to yeah, basically the, the simplicity of the Swedish language or the, you know, the, the lack of vocabulary. Um, yeah, the Nobel line. And, yeah, I remember uh, that. Yeah. The, 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 the contradictory clause or, or, or it is so important. You know, in Sweden, um, it's not finding points of agreement. It's stressing points of difference. You know, it, it's not, oh, right, you did really well. It's you didn't do this well. You know, it's taken for granted that what is, is as it should be. And what isn't up to the standard there's a massive projection that always goes on of well you know yeah you did that but you didn't really do it that well <laughs> it, it really it really is very it, 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 it it's answering an affirmative always with the with the negative do you think with the negative a Side of it. Yeah. Do you it, think it, there's a it's Calvinism? Much worse than a cup half full. Much worse than a cup half full. Is there is there a Calvinism? Is there a Calvinism going on there? Well, it's Lutherism here, and Lutherism and Calvinism are are, are quite elected, quite quite connected. But the the difference between the two, the what they don't have in Sweden that Calvinism has, Calvinism has unconditional election, right? which means that you literally can do no wrong. So in, in, in the doctrine of, 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 of um, unconditional election, which is a Calvinist doctrine, if you are chosen, right? So chosenness in Judaism, the, the chosen people, it's, it's the chosen priestly caste is, is what that's actually about. If, 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 you, if, if you read um, uh, Jew, uh, Jewish... Uh, doctrine, whatever, uh, and and go back and and read that part of the Bible and what people have said about it properly. What they say is, the chose the promised land is Israel, yes, but the chosen people is chosen in the sense of a priestly caste, i.e., um, the the cho that it, it, from this tribe of of Israel, the tribe the of Abraham, will come yeah. chosen caste of that will be the priests administering to the people's relationship with God through through that priestly caste to God. So that's what chosenness means in Judaism. In Calvinism, chosenness means that you're unconditionally elected to go to heaven because God has chosen you before birth and by divine right, whatever you do, however bad you've got no that there's no grace okay it's by by the grace of god you are going to heaven come what may murder as many people as you like you know do as many wrong things that. as I you like you are unconditionally elected and going to heaven come what may and so so the the idea of absolution under catholicism now that's a different thing you've done wrong but you've accepted and, and and served contrition for your sins and sought forgiveness and then you're absolved by the priest right so indulgences uh, uh you know so so CO2. You, you could forego the confession pay the money to the church and of course of course god's going to let you off then isn't he right but by far and away the most um uh, and this is why Lutheranism is so different to Calvinism is this idea that obviously the Lutheranism a bit is is we're all we're all miserable sinners. Um, that, that's on uh, Ilkley Moor Bar Tat, you know, we are all miserable sinners. Yeah, did you know that one? Dirty fuckers. Well, is that from Life like that Ride or something? Yeah. Well, no, no, it's an old rugby song. It's, it's, um, it, ah. it, it, yeah, it's quite funny. But anyway, so we're all miserable <laughs> sinners and dirty fuckers, right? That's Lutheranism. Whereas if you're chosen and unconditionally elected in, in, in Calvinism, you can be the most miserable, dirty fucker ever, but you're still going to heaven. Uh, so that's the difference. And so in Sweden, it's, you know, 
you know, oh, well, you did do that, but you're a miserable sinner and a dirty fucker. Whereas in Calvinism, it's, yeah, yeah, you, you know, you're a miserable, dirty fucker, but you, you're still going to heaven because you're unconditionally elected. So anyway, so, so, so it's, it's not Calvinism in Sweden, it's Lutheranism, which I think does have a tendency to... Um, uh, to point out people's shortcomings, and then so then you come to what Jesus said about remove the mote in your own eye before you move the splinter in someone else's. So there we are. A nice look. Well, it's not even Sunday. Look, it's Saturday <laughs> today, isn't it? I'm flying. I'm flying to the UK tomorrow. <laughs> are you? Uh, yeah, I'm flying tomorrow. I've got oh, a seven o'clock yeah, flight. Said, yeah, yeah. No, you said yeah, yeah, yeah. And and um, how long do you reckon you're going to be? Do you reckon you'll be for much longer than? previous or well so you've got to do the quarry mum and her twin sister my two sisters are coming back to sweden last week of july first week of August for a holiday over here so I'll, I'll be coming back about the 21st of july i think i've i've got a flight so i'll have two two weeks on the road after i do my isolation or quarantine yeah brilliant yeah. all right well I, i'll i'll let you um continue enjoying the rest of your time in sweden um yeah we're going to the beach today i've got, got rasmus surfboard yesterday so we're going to go and t try it out down the beach oh brilliant um before yeah. you go i just want to quickly mention this uh found this in the bookshop uh it's sort of coming out around now it's called inheritance um and it's by uh -huh. the, by somebody called leo hollis i think leo Hor hollis runs verso because I met him at a party oh, okay. once yep. uh, for the book about Bill Gates, the No Such Thing as a Free Gift. Um, uh -huh. I met him, tall guy. So who's Mary Davis? Yeah, so, so The Lost History of Mary Davis, A Story of Property, Marriage and Madness. Mary Davis, I believe, was born in 1663. Um, and to do with her lineage, basically, she was the person for various reasons who was going to inherit the land that is today called Grosvenor Square. Now, okay. Yeah, when it was being lined up, uh, it was outside London. But by the time she was alive, yeah. London had expanded into it. Um, they do a line from a poem that you probably know where they talk about the sheep killing uh, the public um, to do with the enclosures. Uh, a no, Utopia. There's a line from Utopia, I think, to do with mm -hmm. um, how they move the people off the land. So suddenly the sheep have a nicer life than the people that used to live there. Right. Um, but anyway, it's, um, it's to do with um, the way in which you have forced marriages and that sort of thing. So this woman who's supposed to inherit everything would have been far better off if she didn't have such a huge inheritance. Um, mm -hmm. Because that inheritance didn't make her happy. In fact, it meant that she was forced into marriage as a massive legal case. I don't know if she won it or she lost it. I think she lost the legal case. Somebody just said that he had married her. And therefore he had the right to this and the right to that. And wow. they just she just woke up one day there was a man in her bed and he had intended to marry her and then he just said look we're married you can't remember but you married me mm. so he went up to the people and charged rent from all the people that lived on the land and there was a huge mm. court case and so it was i mean to me there were elements which were familiar to me uh when i just thought well look at this huge court case they argue the what toss very, that's when, when was that published? The, this, the book, this book, not this the book, poem, but this, the... No, no, the book is, um, it comes out in America in July and it came out here about two or three weeks ago. Come out, wow, that, that's interesting. Because there's, um, I was talking to Julia the other day and that, that there's been some progress on the various cases against different banks for, uh, uh, effectively, the banks have dispossessed many people of their real property in a similar way to that um and 
Kevin Hollinrope was on the uh, Transparency Forum the other night. I haven't watched it yet. I'm yeah, I did watch look. it. Either. Yeah, I heard about it. Apparently, it. saying that they've made some. So, so but the the point is that there has been a kind of enclosure going on. This is this is you know um, coercive aggregation and primitive accumulation. I think I told you about. I, I, I did a blog about it a couple of days ago, but I was I was speaking to a guy that was studying, I think, sociology. He was doing a doctorate in sociology back in about 2012. And he and I got into he had a theory of something called coercive aggregation. Um, and, and, and this is uh, Saskia Sasson's um, paper as well. I, I, I did a I did a couple of blogs this last couple of weeks. So they're, tech, they're, they're interesting in the sense that I, I've been doing a lot on why there aren't enough affordable homes being built you know is it by accident or design um and that is actually related to this process of coercive aggregation consolidation um and uh monopolization and that is it's related to the mass as well and mcdonald's and um I, what I, I recorded a number of videos the last couple of days, which which are going to be processed. Um, I was in the middle of starting to do that when you rang. I can see the, your green um, screen behind when you. I rang you. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I had this up in the living room, so the, I, I've taken it down and it's just yeah. just in my my little little cubby hole there. So um, the idea. of I mean John's blog today brings together a number of these ideas but in house building there's been a consolidation of house builders and the house builders have got bigger their monopoly position has got stronger the construction industry has got weaker because the number of contractors uh, and so now you have a number of very large international contractors that more or less stand their own. But the same thing has happened in the house building market as has happened in in with, as the supermarkets have consolidated. They have put their supply chains under the cosh and basically abused the smaller businesses. Um, and so what we've what we've got is surveillance capitalism, disaster capitalism. But we've also it, it is monopoly state capitalism. I mean, you've got these monopolies that exploit everything underneath the large combines. It's the return of the robber barons. It's just the return of the robber barons. And that is a process that has accelerated through the pandemic um, and one that was identified in that book Creorder Out of Chaos. You know, the one that I did is the Israeli um, economist or whatever. Yeah, I don't, uh, know why you keep, chaos. I don't know why you keep calling it Creorder Out of Chaos. Wasn't it called Capital as Power? Yeah, Capital as Power. That's right. But, well, but does it have they, a chapter? There was an article. A, called, right, sorry. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a chapter called Creorder Out of Chaos. And right, Creorder right. was a, a theory that they posited several years ago. But it's all related. Um, and at this stage of the narrative propaganda narratives uh, of the pandemic, um, a number of these dots are so obvious now, uh, like Matt Hancock. All right. He's been caught out having it off with his assistant. You know, nothing new in that. Um, but of course, uh, it's hypocritical. I mean, it is his uh, it, it, it's the Dominic Cummings moment of of. You know, what was it Castle, wherever he went to yeah. up north? Barnard Castle. Yeah. Um, Barnard Castle. Um, it's the modelling guy going round to see his mate. Is, 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 is another guy's wife for a shag? For you know, Ferguson's little jolly. You're right. It's a total. Uh, I mean, it's. I mean, what, what a cast of characters. Well, the the other thing is, is John has just done a series of blogs on on all of cronyism and nepotism within Matt Hancock's in-group, like contracts for his sister, contracts in return for uh, contributions in, in the members register. You yeah, know, the local um, pub, guy who owns the pub. There's a lot of stuff. 
And there's a lot of stuff that John has been publishing. And now this has just come up. You know, will he resign? Is he under any pressure to resign? Tell him it's all of it today. Um, he's not, yeah, but he's but, not going to resign, but, is he? Um, he should go. He should go. What John says, he's got powerful friends. Why, why should these people be basically a corrupt and immoral uh, health secretary in position uh, when, when, you know, he should be getting there? Do you remember how... Why, I, why I, are these experts... Yeah, I mean, do you remember how I mentioned that um, Priti Patel and Michael Gove were the only two people that are MPs mm -hmm. that went to, um, what's his name, uh, Rupert Murdoch's wedding to Jerry Hall. Um, mm -hmm. then, then the question becomes, where does Matt Hancock lie in, in all of that? And Matt Hancock will always be, for me, the guy that delivered Leveson too. He was the media minister that officially fully delivered the binning of any press regulation. And that was something that was really important to Rupert Murdoch and to, to the people from the Daily Mail. Really but important. The sun gunning for it. The sun gunning. I know they are, but at the I don't same, know why that would be. Yeah, I know that, but at the same and I know that they really didn't have to do the CCTV thing. Yeah, I I get that that is all optional. They really don't have to do it. And so then the idea is um, is this all in advance of a reshuffle next week? You know? And so it's kind of like this constant you know, reshuffle, you know. And, and, and the, the, the spooks, Hancock's a weak link in the chain. He, he, his corruption is coming out anyway. Get rid of him now, you know, on something else. And then 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 they can carry. So so it's a distraction. But at the same, you know, obviously. I mean, Hancock is an idiot, right? I, I know he's, you know, John seems to think he's he, he, he's an idiot savant of some sort. No, but he's I doing... He's he, yeah, no, some people say he's really clever. The point is, he's doing a fucking brilliant job of um, what they want done. So that's the reason why it's really difficult well, for them to... Well, that's right, yeah, yeah. He's doing a brilliant yeah. job, which is just standing there holding the ball. Yeah. But for who? For who... For who is the brilliant job? You know, who well, is the as you, as you said, the main the main uh, yeah the main agenda is is is, is Klaus really man behind? Well, I mean, you know, we don't need to we don't need a person, but the point is that the the various agenda are data like UK health data needs to travel as quickly as possible. He was there at the stump trying to argue for allowing the data to go through. I mean, maybe in a way, if you think about it, maybe having all of this thing about his private life now and him somehow working a way of clinging on might help with the other thing that he's trying to do, which is just argue the case for the Brits, for the Brits I, to, to let go of their data. I, I think he's smoke. I, I think he's smoke. I, I think they're getting rid of him. Um, and it must be, in my opinion, because there's something bigger coming down the pipe, um, and he's yeah. now expendable. Yeah, but, that's yeah, my yeah, own. Yeah, but, yeah, but okay. But I mean, regardless of Hancock being there or not, as you said, the most important thing is the agenda, which is make it look like there is still such a thing as the NHS, and you know, allow for the continuation of the changeover for the data to just be handed over, and for there to just be. Uh, private sector contracts increasing and that type of thing. And with Biden, you know, it's all this it's the, Biden thing. Shock, it's the shock doctrine all over again. Yeah. It's that, you know, it's ramping up, uh, mopping up the the, uh, the last vestiges is of, of any yeah. but uh, they need to wealth keep it in Japan. Yeah, but they should really try and keep him. I mean, I understand Johnson wanting to keep him because however much Cummings, because you can't give in to Cummings. Well, you know, Johnson you, wants to keep him because anybody looks good next to Matt Hancock. He's such a fucking moron. Exactly. So there's so many reasons to keep him. And the thing is that there's no I mean, who cares what everybody thinks? You know, Johnson's still got a few years to the election. I mean, the question is, when will Hancock go? Is he going to stay to the end? Uh, well, I, I, I don't think Boris will make it to, to a full term. I, I think they want him out of the way, too. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Good point. 
And he needs to make some money now as well. That's what Cummings' point, wasn't it? Cummings' point was he needs to, to well, leave. Well, there, there were money. lots of rumours saying he was going to go this spring, Boris. Do you remember the run-up to the end of last year? There were rumours that... I, I think Lloyd was saying as well that he didn't think that he was going to be... Uh, you know, there was some question about his health after him having had COVID. Uh, there were questions about his financial health. Um, and then there were also, you know, questions about whether he had the political will to, 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 to keep going. I mean, uh, do you do In you many think, respects, you, he served his purpose because he's fudged Brexit, you know. Yeah. Well, do you think that that's a good point? I mean, do you think that he has any type of a future afterwards? Uh, well, I mean... Do you think he could basically just I mean, be forgotten he, about? Who's well, going to listen to him? Whatever we think about him, he, look, look, he's a good writer. There, you know, there's no question that he's a good writer. I mean, I, 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 you know, we've got to give him that. Credit where credit's due. He's a good writer and he'll... He... he, 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 he he might not do as well as Tony Blair after the event, um, but he'll probably do better than David Cameron. I mean, because David Cameron with the green cell thing, you know, it's almost as if there's a there's a, 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 a push to discredit the politics in the Western world by populating it with these absolute no name or no these nonsense politicians. That they basically give the democratic institutions of the West a bad name. Um, and I don't think that's by accident. It's almost as if they were sort of thinking, right, how can we discredit this institution we call democracy, <laughs> this parliamentary democracy? What we'll do is we'll populate it with the most unbelievable shower of morons that we can possibly assemble. And the people will be so fed up, they're going to accept Klaus Schwab's technocracy. It, it's almost as if they're doing that on purpose. Did you see? Did you see that I did a blog post a couple of days ago? Uh, I did. I, I, it was private. I, I, something about sliding doors. And I, and, no, 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 and no, no, no. That was no, no, no. That was that, no. That was for that was that was for one of my students. Um, I did. Um, I did something called. Um, buh, 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 buh. Oh, I didn't even give it a clever title. I basically just said the chickens. Because we're going to go to the beach once mummy's got the chickens under the heat lamp. We've got baby chicks today. Oh, okay. We've got a little one there. Is that that one? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> we've got a, an incubator and the, the, the chicks have just started to hatch. So we're going to have, you know, 12 little chicks in a little run under right. a heat lamp. <laughs> I like Rasmus's hat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he got it off amazon it's a, a russian army hat <laughs> yeah brilliant yeah. well so i did this blog post basically george osborne has been made chair of the british museum and so the first the first couple of messages people said well you know someone who's been so good at domestic looting being in charge of an international hall um yeah. <laughs> and then um and then also i noticed something that other people hadn't because i'd already noticed it so the government response to Greensill was of course uh boris said oh yes we'll conduct our own review that review is called the boardman review i looked up nigel boardman mm. from slaughter and may it turns out his father was chief sec chief secretary to the treasury uh conservative uh city of london and that type of thing but also uh, he was chair of natwest the father nigel boardman's dad uh, but Boardman, right. he's doing the Boardman review. He's already done two reviews into the government procurement under COVID and somehow cleared Hancock and everybody of rampant looting. And so he's doing this new review. But I did mention that he was he was on the board of Save the Children, along with Samantha Cameron. So that's all quite mm -hmm. chunk. Uh, and Alan Parker was the chair. Mm -hmm. And I said, Alan Parker's like Michael Rimmer. I mean, you know, you couldn't really get much more Michael Rimmer than Alan Parker. Uh, you know, he was chums with Brown and he was chums with um, the other one. I think he employed Sarah McCauley, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Brown's wife. Um, but then the next point was um, Boardman, according to the British Museum's website, he's deputy chair of the British Museum. God. And he's supposed to be doing an investigation into chumocracy. But he's, yeah. he's going to be 
you know, you can't see it on, when they put the list of trustees, you can't see it. But there's because I've looked at it before. I look him up and it's there. It says deputy chair, British Museum. Uh, so so uh, I put it up. I haven't pushed it too much. But, you know, you kind of say, all right, well, there you go. It's like they don't really. This is in line with what you just said. <laughs> like, yeah. like, how could you trash this stuff more? And, you know, they don't report on it, but it's total yeah. tr trashing. Yeah. I mean, it's been pointed out there's no opposition in the House of Commons. They, yeah. You know, they, they, it's a process that started with Brexit and it started with the uh, with the Supreme Court o uh, overruling um, of a government decision. Now, it. The challenges in the court to that were all sidetracked. English Democrats had a challenge to uh, some of that stuff. Mm. Um, so, I, uh, John's blog is really good today. It, it really is worth reading um, okay. because you, you've got to look outside the distraction of the so-called pandemic. Um, and and now the shape, the, all, all, they... they, they necessarily they have to start moving their pieces into into position to go for checkmate um and so my own view is is that they've overplayed the narrative since february they they should have they should have stuck to dates not uh, the data not dates and by extending beyond that they 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 they're going for they're going for another chunk that they weren't expecting to be able to get delivered this time. And, and they, I think they're overreaching and overplaying their hand. And, and whether the Hancock will be the moment of um, the, the toppling over due to the overreach or not, I don't know. But by overreaching, I think they've probably also alienated the part of the oligarchy that wasn't fully in, on board with rigging the um, US election. I've no doubt that election was rigged, that, that Biden didn't win. I was with, um, I was with somebody, I, I, I was with somebody I, yesterday who was telling me the same thing. No. I, I'm absolutely certain that Macron's election was rigged and they're trying to get fixing to, to rig the next one uh, with running Barnier. Now, uh, I think John blogged about that last week, but is Barnier Michael gonna Barnier apparently is gonna, he's going to form his own on marsh on marsh like you know he, 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 here comes macron with a new party and gets in oh no i know where i watched it um on the duran you know the duran alan McCurley, McCurley, who, who writes the duran um and and there's another there's another greek guy that's on there that they, they were regular ga uh, uh, guests on crosstalk uh on rt which is one of my favorite pro programs it, it, it i haven't watched it much this year but but um it's an american journalist um that works for rt actually in russia uh, he's he's an ultra conservative guy but a very very knowledgeable and i really enjoy his program they get some very good russian commentators on as well you know and and uh, i mean the russians aren't afraid of intellectualism that that's the good thing you know one of the good things about russian culture well, 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 all cultures, really. I mean, it's, it's only our TOFs are kind of anti-intellectual. Um, you know, UK TOFs, you know, it's uh, it's, it's, it's suspected. Um, but it was them, they were talking about a brilliant programme, talking about how in the recent elections in France, uh, Madame Le Pen had lost ground, uh, although gained ground on Macron. Macron's uh, political... A standing is in tatters in France um, to the extent there's no way that he can, without rigging it again, win win the presidency again. Um, and so they're already lining up Michel Barnier for doing his own thing. But if you look up the Duran on YouTube, it's the Duran. The last three episodes that they've done have been very good. Um, but yeah, uh, it, that that's where I saw that. But all this stuff is going on, Ranjan, around the world, you know, stuff in Germany and what have you. The reason Germany's got such a hard lockdown is definitely because the Germans don't like debt. And, and this whole thing is, is being built on a, an absolute tsunami of debt. I mean, the only thing that I know about Germany at the moment, so the, the two things, so you're talking about individual personal debt, right? 
Yes, um, the, the, it's very difficult to get the Germans off cash. They, they, it's got the lowest credit card uptake in the whole of Europe, uh, and it's a big problem for banking. Uh, it, there are lots of papers about it. If you if you look at the banking academic press, uh, the academic um, uh, circles, there, there's lots of published. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned. This before. On, I mean, you know what the other irony is, for me, that Adolf Hitler, you know, people say his big spending in the 30s meant that he was one of the first people to adopt Keynesian policies, and that. <sighs> And that basically, yeah. I mean, I. But if you but read, you know, the, the just, whole just, Keynesian, just, Hayekian, all of that stuff, I think is a is a bit of a distraction. Um, and and people talk about what Keynesianism is without reading Keynes. Yeah, but that, what I wanted to, that, that, but, what, but what I wanted to say was just it, it wasn't so much about that excessively. It was just to say that Hitler was doing spending in a certain way. That was in line in some ways with what people say that Keynes. Yeah. Well, but... he, he, he was he was basically running a, a, a martial economy, um, an economy pointed at war. Yeah, and that's yeah. Uh, but, but I mean, it very meant, similar. But it, meant, but it meant deficits, right? Uh, right. Well, if you want to talk about the financing of. Of, of 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 the Nazi regime, um, you you've got to get back into Schacht and all of that stuff. And, and Anthony Margolis at uh, the Real Currencies blog, um, who, who backs a crypto called Florin, he he's written several very very good articles about the idea that that um, Hitler was some sort of monetary reformer, which he wasn't. Um, so. No, it was financed on the same model as, as other central banks in the same way that uh, the Soviet Union always had a central bank as well. Um, so during the Russian Revolution and all the rest of it. Uh, so, yeah. What, what, I, but do you see what I mean, though? He I'm, was spending. I, I, I've, I've got reprints of, of some of Anthony's blogs on my blog um, and and. He, he's written several excellent articles about the financing of the of, of the Nazis um, and, and this idea that um, that that uh, somehow uh, Hitler wanted a sovereign currency. OK, but what I mean, I'm just I mean, I didn't mean to go into this in any detail or make any big point. But was he raising money through issuing bonds, taxes, privatization? You know, what's the story? No, well, I mean, Back then, privatisation wasn't a thing, Randy. No, of course not. I didn't mean that I thought he was. I didn't think he was doing privatisation. But I meant, was he raising bonds or issuing or taxes or, you know, what? where was... Back, back, look, back in those days, there was the gold standard and you borrowed against your gold reserves and, and on your future sort of uh, industrial capacity or capacity to raise tax from your productive economy and people productive economy, right. economy. and is that and what he so, was doing um yeah so international debt and the settlement of international debts under the gold standard was, was quite a different thing so i published on my Yumpu channel they're not public facing uh called the um international trilemma uh miss mr churchill's um i remember when you question to the treasury yeah, I remember you spent it. I remember um, that, you telling me that all, you spent a week looking at that. Yeah, this is what that that's what this is all about. Um, and if you look at how Hitler financed the Nazi regime, um, it was it was it was financed by New York bankers. I and mean, it's all there's yeah, tons sure, sure. and tons of stuff yeah. Now, but may I may I just may I just say this because obviously what you're saying is interesting, but I just want to quickly make the point that I wanted to make, uh, which is that if Hitler was uh, well. well you... the Hitler was some sort of proto Keynesian. No, so the, my point was not so much whether he was a Keynesian or not, but was wherever he got his money from, he was spending money that was not magicked out of thin air. There were people that were giving him the money or whatever it was. Something was going on, and therefore, I think that that whole system of everything from between the wars. That whole system 
um, in the economic consequences of the peace, I think. So at the end of World War One, that thing that Keynes wrote, he does talk about this thing that you can do, which is um, the Keynesian way of doing it, you know, where he basically says saving is bad and, you know, you should spend. So it's quite interesting that now the Germans still but have... You have to look at the predicates to, to that conclusion. And, and so if, if, if the conclusion is, right, saving is bad, that is only with certain predicates. Yeah, so but... what... what and, 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 and so... It, but I'm not talking one, about... What okay. one set of circumstances, what one set of facts... That is perhaps the case. No, 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 but sure, another, sure, sure. But it, it, it's not, it doesn't but, have to be the case. Yeah, that, no, no, sure, no, that, no, I, that's the problem with obviously these discussions. Yeah, but the is difference that there between. Just isn't an, yeah, but the difference between what I'm saying here. So, what I'm saying is not about absolutes, about what's good or bad, but about what Keynes was saying uh, at a certain point about the idea that some people said savings are, uh, uh, are very good. And that Keynes also occasionally said that savings can be very bad. And so the idea that the Germans have not changed, they've basically just said savings are good. And, you know, and basically that he thought that he had fixed that problem. But yeah, and, and he hadn't because they think today. Uh, I, I, I'm not good. going to say yes or no, Ranjan, because you can't cover enough of the starting assumptions on that question in a short enough space of time to, you know, it, it's, it's a huge question. It's a much bigger question, so many variables. And so there isn't a yes or no answer, but my, but, you know, my, my instinct is to say, actually, I'm not going to answer that. It become the, because it's not a yes or no answer. It just isn't that simple. It really isn't. There, there are a number of other factors. Uh, we, we, and it's such an important question. Uh, it's, it, it, Margolis does it justice in his in in his 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 blog post about it. It was quite quite long. In that but, in that but, in that case, but, can I just quickly do this? Mm. And this is this is the Candide approach. <laughs> which is basically you know it's like the gk chesterton if a thing's worth doing it's worth doing badly if mm. i'm gonna if i'm gonna make an argument <laughs> i'd rather i'd rather make a bad argument and and then say there you go terrible argument and everyone go yes yes terrible argument so how about this okay in the same way mm. that that dr bangloss said to candide look there is such a thing as the nose and there are such a thing as a gl as glasses Therefore, the nose was created in order for glasses to perch on, right? right. For, for spectacles. <laughs> I'm perfectly okay with that. And so in the same way, I would say this. Germany has a large surplus. Therefore, all Germans love surplus. There you go. I've done it. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I suspect there may be some weaknesses in yeah, well, I, 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 I hope that made you feel better because it doesn't make me feel any better. <laughs> no, I mean, I suspect I'm completely wrong on many levels, but I'm so, so pleased that I got it out. Yeah, well, I'm pleased for you too. <laughs> I'm looking forward to, in future at some stage, us going over how wrong I might be and where it's wrong. Well, oh, well, I mean, yeah, I, think well, I think it's, I think it's yeah, connected. I, I think it's no, connected. I, I, in what possible universe you probably are, you know, you're bound to be right in one of the possible universes that, it, that, that, that well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely that right. In, I'm definitely yeah. right in, <laughs> in the Panglossian universe. Exactly. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right, I think you need to get ready for tomorrow and uh, get ready for the beach. I do. Like We're going to go, go up the beach and then uh, I've got to pack and all the rest of it. I'm staying overnight at the hotel at the airport because my flight's at seven in the morning. So. OK, well, brilliant talking to you. And I look forward to catching up with you in Wales. Yes, for sure. Uh, and I'll be seeing you in a week or two as well. So.
Brilliant. Okay, well, lots of love. And, Look uh, after yourself. Yep, if you go to that demo, do be careful, because John reckons it might kick off, and he's probably not wrong. Okay, yeah, fine, brilliant. Mm. Much appreciated. I might take. I might look yeah. a bit silly with my bicycle helmet. Yeah, well, yeah, well, put a wet towel in your uh, in your rucksack because they might be tear gas. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Thanks a lot. See you in a bit. See you, Ranjan. Take Bye. care. Bye.